so it's about time, so we should get started. So today we have Professor Gail McClellan from North Carolina State. And Gail graduated from USCSD in 96. From there she moved on to the Institute of Nuclear Theory at Washington. And from there she worked at Triumph and Studio Group for a few years before joining NCSU in 2005 as a faculty. Her research interests have been in particles and nuclear astrophysics. And in specific, she's an expert in detecting supernova, supernova neutrinos and neutrino interaction and element synthesis in astrophysical systems, like accretion disks and supernova explosions. So today she'll be talking about neutrinos and the sites of our processes. Okay. Yeah, so thanks very much for the introduction, and thanks very much for the opportunity to come to CETA and give a seminar. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, and I am a neutrino and nuclear astrophysicist, so I'm interested in uh, microphysics of systems like uh, supernovae, accretion disks, things like that. And I'm also interested in nucleosynthesis, so I'm interested in where the R process elements come from. So I'd like to structure this talk around the site of the R process. So I'll start by introducing you to the general R process problem, where we are right now. And then I will talk a little bit about two methods that we can use to go about attacking this problem. One is to look at possible sites of the R process, and one of them is to try to go backwards and use the abundance pattern to tell us something about what's going on. OK, so the R process elements. Well, the R process elements involve things like uranium. And so if you look at uranium, you see you have a whole lot of neutrons in uranium. And so if you want to make R process elements, the most likely place to look is places where you have a lot of neutrons. Uh, so typically, a rapid neutron capture process occurs by capturing neutrons and beta decaying. So this over here is an example of a flow plot. And I'll show you a whole bunch of flow plots in this talk. So this is the simplest example of a flow plot. So this has number of protons on this side and number of neutrons on this side. And every dot on this plot would be a different isotope of a different nucleus. So if you have a nucleus here and you want to turn it into something like uranium, then you capture a neutron, capture a neutron, and then beta decay takes you in that direction. You occasionally beta decay. And then you keep capturing more neutrons. And at least in the classical idea of where an R process takes place, you uh, assume that you're in N gamma gamma N equilibrium, which means that these two reactions right here, where you capture a neutron and emit a photon, or when you, where you capture a photon and emit a neutron, are in equilibrium. So that would mean that the distribution of isotopes of a particular element would be determined just by the masses of the element, as in a sort of a mini nuclear statistical equilibrium. OK, so we want to figure out where the R process elements could come from. So we have to look around and say, well, where are there a lot of neutrons? And so of course there are lots of neutrons in a neutron star, but the problem with a neutron star is that you have to get the stuff out of the neutron star, so they're not so good at ejecting material unless you collide them together. So a neutron star merger is one possibility. Or another possibility, another leading contender would be core collapse supernovae. And these are a couple pictures that I stole from other people. This one is from my neighbor, John Blondin at NC State, of an exploding supernova. So, and then we also have that that's a would be a compact object merger, and then some elements are coming off here in the tidal tail, and some come off the size of the disks, and some would be ejected in kind of a wind that's coming out at you. Okay, so if we're going to calculate, so okay, we want to determine if a site is a good R process site or not. So. One thing we can do is we can look at a model of that site, possibly calculated by somebody else. And we can look at what the temperature and density look like and where the particles are going. And then we can do a calculation with that. And we can look at all possible, like 3,000 nuclear reactions, and see what happens 
to say a little mass element and see what we get at the end. And then we have to decide if we did a good job or not, if we actually got the elements. And so we have to compare with data. And there's actually a bunch of different uh, pieces of data that we could compare with. But the very simplest thing you can do is you can go and you can look at all the elements that there are in the sun. And you look, can look at all the isotopes that you see on the Earth. And you can put it to, you can just make a big table. And you can plot what you have. And this is abundance over here versus uh, mass number of your nucleus over here. OK, and this is everything. This is not just, well, everything above 80 or so, but not just the R process elements. But you can already see that there are some features in this plot. OK, so it's not just random. We see a peak here, a peak here, a peak here, and a bump here. And these are features that we expect to come from the R process. So this one is called the third peak. This is called the second peak. This is called the first peak. And this is, these are the rare earths. That's called the rare earth peak. So if we do a good calculation, then we'd like to match these features. OK, so there's more data that we can look at beyond that. We can look at isotopic ratios from meteorites, or we can look at observations from, from old stars. So here's a plot where the little red, uh, red dots are observed abundances from, a, from an old star in the halo. And the blue line is the same line that you saw before, but just the R process part. And it, and it looks a little different because it's plotted versus atomic number here. So when you do spectroscopy, it's easier to see elements and not so much isotopes. And you can see here that it looks, the red dots, at least in this part of the plot, the red dots seem to be right on top of where the blue line goes. And that tells you that you'd like to, so if, uh, if, you're, if you see that in a star that's relatively old, then you haven't had, it hasn't had time to be contaminated yet by lots and lots of processes. And if you say, because it could be that on Earth, all the uranium, what you see, all the uranium was made in one event, and all the europium is made in some of it, another event. And what you see here in that curve on the, in, on the Earth is that just some random pattern that came from mixing different events together. And the fact that you see the same thing over and over again suggests that you're looking for a process that occurs the same way over and over again. It also suggests that you, if you're looking at old stars low Fe over H, then it suggests that you want a process that will operate early in the history of the galaxy. OK, so if you think that you want a robust process. So, sorry, first you said there were multiple sites. And you said they were very consistent. So what's the evidence for multiple sites? What's the evidence for multiple sites? Oh, yeah, I didn't talk about that. So this part of the pattern does not match as well. It's a little hard to see from this curve, but there's been a lots of analysis that says this part doesn't match as well. And so this part, some people sometimes call the main R process, and that's what I was going to talk about today. And this part, people sometimes call the weak R process. And that, this is not clear at all where that comes from. If you look at these, it's all, while the relative amount of stuff you see in stars vary, the, the amplitude of the whole curve, you can shift up and down. You, you get a really nice pattern, for the most part, that, that seems to match solar. This is not the case at all. And so people are studying you know, correlations of different elements. And it could be that it's not just one. This, this people guess, is one site. This, it's not even clear if all this is made in one place. Perhaps there are even multiple sites here. Yeah. OK, so as I said, um, I like to work on the microphysics. I'm interested in the nuclear physics and the neutrino astrophysics. So I showed you that view of the beautiful explosions that uh, or uh, merging um, neutron stars. I'm sure you have seen or even produced many beautiful plots yourself. But, but since I'm interested in the microphysics, my view is kind of more like this in the cartoons. OK, so this is, this is in the core collab supernova. So this is the proto-neutron star core that's at the center of the core collab supernova. And, and I care about neutrino scattering emission and nu nucleosynthesis. And actually, my two favorite topics are how the neutrinos oscillate after they leave the core and all this material that's flowing away, how you take the free neutrons and protons and combine them together 
and make nuclei. That's why I'm interested in the R process. Here's a, here's a sort of a, a disk that might come from a compact object merger or, or maybe a supernova that has a lot of rotation, like a collapsar. And you can see that the geometry is very different. Um, but if you're looking at the microphysics, you have a lot of the same things that one wants to keep in mind. So the neutrinos have to scatter around here and work their way out. The, the disk doesn't get quite as dense as the proto-neutron star, but you still have to understand the nuclear physics of the disk. And then my two favorite things are going on. You have nuclei that are, you know, that have to, are free neutrons and protons, so they're going to wind up forming nuclei. And then you have neutrinos that are going to get emitted. They're, this is so hot that you also trap neutrinos here, and they're going to become released, and they're going to undergo oscillations. OK, so let's think about, uh, so I said before, we have two main contenders for where the R process not, might take place. One is from core club, in core club supernovae, and one is in neutron star mergers. So the first question you might ask is, well, let's look at this environment, and, and do you even make enough nuclei in this environment to account for all the R process material that you see? And so you can look at how much R process material you can see in the galaxy, and then you can say, based on the frequency, the expected frequency of core collapse supernova, if every supernova made a certain amount of R process, how it, much would it need to make? And it needs to make around 10 to the minus 6 solar masses or so. And that is pretty much in line with what you might predict coming off of a neutrino-driven wind. So that's, that's not so bad. And then core collapse supernova tend to evolve quickly. So there's not really a problem with finding them in, in halo stars, in old, in old stars. So that's all pretty good. So that's looking promising. So we should do a calculation now. And so um, we, we core collapse supernova, it's generally thought that the, the neutrino driven wind, the little bit of material that's lifted off the proto neutron star by the neutrinos, is the environment where you might find the R process. So we, we use a model, we make our best guess of what the outflow time scale is, what the entropy is, what the relative numbers of neutrons to protons are, which actually is a reasonably complicated calculation. Um, uh, where we worry about all these reactions down here of the neutrinos. And if you remember, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to kind of match that blue curve I, I had at the beginning. So I want to see peaks, and then I want to see that rare earth bump. And so, okay, let me go ahead and do a calculation. And, and this is the result. So this is the, this is the line I showed you before, and this is the result of the calculation. Okay, so this is obviously a total disaster, right? We're not getting, if we want to get, well, it's not a total disaster if you're interested in those elements, but if you want to make our process this way, and you were hoping that you would match all the observations by doing it, this is not your best theoretical model. Okay, and so, so what went wrong here is it actually looked pretty promising at the beginning. So it looked like when we started, we had a fair number of neutrons to start with. And, and in fact, people realized that in the early 90s, and, and they declared victory and said, OK, this is where the, the R process takes place. But then, then a couple things happened. One is that they, they started to realize that perhaps the entropy was that, that had been predicted was a little bit high. And the other thing is that the neutrino interactions were not included all the way through. Okay, so even though they did really nice things, anti-neutrino capture on proton made a lot of neutrons. Later on, in the middle of, the, of the, the nucleosynthesis, there were free neutrons left over. So you used all your protons making seed nuclei. There were some neutrons just hanging out there. The electron neutrinos capture on the neutrons and turned them into protons, and they gobbled up all your protons. And that was generally, generally a bad thing. And so you wound up with lots of lots of alpha particles, which produce the sad-looking black curve there. OK, so all right, so then you say, well, all right, let's go to compact object mergers. I didn't really like that, that black curve I, caught, I got. So I know that, that, well, it would be really convenient because core collapse supernova have a nice time scale. But let me go ahead and, and perhaps there are ways to fix that up. So I'm going to look at compact object mergers. 
And as I said, there are a couple places that you can make elements. So, so you can make elements coming off the tidal tails and expansion of the disk. You can also, my favorite is, is winds that come off a disk of a merging neutron star. So that would be elements that are being pushed off at you. These are pictures of the uh, neutrino decoupling temperatures inside the disk. Um, so, and that works pretty well. So um, there's lots of people that have done calculations on this and there's lots of places that you can get the R process. And you get, also get it from winds. You manage to avoid that, that, that bad uh, new E reaction, electron neutrino reaction. And then you have all the stuff that comes off in other, in other regions of the merging compact object. And since it started very neutron rich, then you're left with lots of neutrons that you can happily capture on nuclei. And, and this is kind of the worst case scenario, and this is the best case scenario. I about these winds from the surface of the desk. Um, the the difference is that is it's a ge geometry difference. So it turned the neutrinos have more influence at the beginning, and they set a, a neutron to proton ratio that's that's favorable. But then because of the geometry, by the time you're making the R process, you're far enough out they aren't doing all that. They're not doing the bad things that they were doing before. No, the winds start the winds start at a similar it's it's not really a density effect. It's really more of a geometry of the neutrinos and where the neutrinos are important. And the starting the starting neutron abundance is a little bit different, yeah. They're a little bit different, yeah. Yeah, they're more similar in the proto-neutron star than they seem to be in the, and you can, you can kind of see that in this picture here. In the proto-neutron star, they're really, I have, a, I have a picture of that, but it's not in this talk. In the proto-neutron star, they decouple at really, really similar places. But in the in accretion disk, they seem to decouple differently. And you have this giant region of high energy. They're left. They're they're this. Well, this is a this is a very the surface over which they're getting emitted is smaller, but they have a big red region, and it's the big red region that's that you like because the, the red is the higher temperature. I should have explained. Okay, so then you can say how much, then you can ask your basic question, am I going to get enough R process to account for what I see in the, in the galaxy that way? And you can say, you can, I'm, I'm sure some of you here are much better at making estimates of how often there will be neutron star mergers in the galaxy, but if you take what you see in the literature, what's most commonly quoted in the literature, you determine that you need about 10 to the minus 2 solar masses. And that's kind of on the upper end of what's predicted, not in winds, but in the ejection from the tidal tails. And so that's, that's plausible that you would get enough R process material this way. The thing that's, that's not, that's a little more tricky is that the, you need to get the R process elements in, in the low, low FE over H stars, in the halo stars, and you need to get it with not too much scatter which is a little harder to do with, uh, with the mergers, although there is a recent paper that suggests that there's a, it's possible. That's something that the community needs to work on a bit. So the current status of this problem is that core collapse supernova, they're good because they right, have the right evolution time, so we would so much like it if they could be our, our process site. But from an astrophysical modeling point of view, it's a little bit hard to figure out without tweaking, without doing tweaking, how you're going to get enough neutrons. Um, then compact object mergers is really easy to see how you'd have lots and lots of neutrons, but we have to do a little more work to get really comfortable with, uh, with the required evolution time. OK, so the, how, how do you work on this problem then? Okay. So there's, there's an obvious way to work on it, which is, um, which is something I do and lots of other people do, 
is that you try to improve your model of astrophysical sites. So you just, you yourself improve it or you work with other people that are constantly improving the hydrodynamics and the neutrino transport and then you, you were working on whether you see if enough neutrons are available. Okay. And we don't actually worry too much about fitting the pattern usually because the whole R process is happening way off stability where we don't, we don't necessarily always think we have a great handle on the nuclear physics. So, so mostly we're thrilled if we get uranium, right? And we're not worried too much about matching up points in the curve. And the other, and besides just working on the two main sites, we can start to explore alternate sites. So I'm going to talk about one, one alternate site in the, in the third part of this talk. The other option is that you can, you can work, try and work the problem backwards. Okay? So you can say, well, let's look at the pattern. Let's look at that blue curve and figure out what is required to get that blue curve. Okay, so, so we, have, uh, we have bumps in the curve. So how did those bumps get there? So uh, in the cases of the three main peaks, there's a nuclear physics reason why we think they're there. They're at the closed neutron shells. So that's when beta decay rates get really long and it's um, harder to neutron capture out of there. So you prefer, the, so there's, a, there's some hang up there. But as far as the details of the pattern, that's going to be determined not only by the astrophysics, but also by the nuclear physics. So for each, astro if you want to match that pattern for every astrophysical environment, which is going to have a different set of temperature and density, you're going to need slightly different nuclear physics to do it right. That's a weird way to say it because there's, of course, these nuclei really have only one set of properties. It's not flexible. But if you, considering that we don't know what they are, then you have to get, the, you, want, you need to get the right combination. So if we can try and figure out what the, what the nuclear physics is that's required, and if you could go look for that nuclear physics, then that could tell you something about the astrophysical site in addition to how many neutrons, whether you're just getting enough neutrons or not. So I want to give you, in the this, this second part of the talk, I want to give you an example of what I mean by that. Okay, so I want to pick, I want to look at a part of the pattern and I want to say, how did we get that? How does that, how does that form, right? And so I want to pick something, since it's a sort of a first, first approach, I want to pick something that's, that's really visible, not too subtle, but at the same time, I don't really have a good reason for thinking it exists already. Okay, so as I said, these three main peaks, while I don't really know what the structure of is the peak is, I have a good nuclear physics reason for thinking they should be there, the closed neutron shells. But I, I, there's one more feature that's, not, that's pretty obvious that's not this peak, and it's the rare earth peak. So I want to talk to you about how you could get that bump. Why is that bump there? Okay. So there are two theories for how this bump got here. Okay. So the first one is fission cycling. So you have a nucleus. It's lots of neutrons are capturing on it. As I said, sometimes it's beta decaying, but lots of neutrons are capturing on it. And after it gets big enough, it can't absorb any neutrons anymore, even if it beta decays and captures more neutrons. And so it'll get so big and so heavy that there's no way it can find stability. It'll just split in two in fission. But if I have enough neutrons, then those daughter products are then themselves going to capture again. And they, so there you have the cycle. So and in fission cycling, the idea is that the daughter products land right there. And that's why there's a bump. Okay. Now this sounds usually usually it sounds a little implausible when you first say it, but it's it's not completely because you have another reason for wanting fission cycling. Okay. So you imagine if you have a nucleus and you capture a certain number of neutrons, if you change the number of neutrons that you have to capture slightly, then you'll get a different set of nuclei. Right? But if you fission cycle, you're going through the cycle, you're doing the same thing over and over again, you tend to land in a robust pattern. And since you tend to see the same data, 
you see the same curve in these old stars, then you think, well, maybe I'm looking for something that really does the same thing over and over again. And fission cycling is the most, most, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind. So this plot on the left is a plot that shows you what I'm thinking there, or what I mean. So this axis here, this axis here is number of neutrons. So this is most neutron rich and this is least neutron rich. And this is the ratio of the amount of stuff here to the amount of stuff there. And every dot on this plot is a different calculation. So if you, if you, pull, if you run a calculation and you artificially adjust the number of neutrons and then you measure the ratio of these peaks and you don't have very many neutrons, at the beginning you get zero because you don't have enough neutrons to make the stuff out here. But you continue to, by hand, adjust the calculation so you have more and more neutrons, you start to build up material here. But then you get so, and then it moves beyond this and it gets so heavy they split in two, so you get a dip and then you capture the daughter products and then it keeps going and at some point it doesn't matter how neutron rich you are, you're always getting the same thing. So, so that, is, that will produce what people call is a robust pattern. And this is a little bit hard to address from a nuclear physics standpoint because it's, it's going to be very difficult to find daughter products of these very neutron rich nuclei that we're interested in. But there's another theory for how this peak might get there. And that is it comes from, uh, basically it's a, a, a neutron capture and not a neutron capture in a fission cycling kind of way, but the neutron capture that happens at the very end when you're almost out of neutrons. And it forms, and the neutron capture rate gets very slow, and so you have a whole bunch of stuff that gets stuck here, basically. Okay, so how, how would that work? So now I'm gonna inflict a few flow plots on you. Okay, so this one, this one just tells you how to read a flow plot. Okay. So this is number of neutrons down here, and this is number of protons here. Okay. So as I said before, every dot on this plot is a different number of nuclei, a different, different isotope of a different nucleus. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in the R process, that's very neutron rich nuclei. So here are, here's our stable nuclei, and the R process is happening over here on the neutron rich side of, this, of stability. Okay. So suppose I'm right here. I have a nucleus right here. It has three options. Well, four, it can just sit there. It can capture a neutron and move over here. It can uh, photo dissociate and move over here, or it can beta decay and go in that direction. Okay. Now, I can look at my calculation and I can plot all kinds of things on this flow plot. Okay. So one thing I can plot is I can look at, at every snapshot on the calculation, I can look at the, the most abundant isotope of every element and I can put a little triangle there, okay? And uh, then I draw a line through it and we call that the path. That's the path of the R process. I can plot other things on here. I can look at the beta decay rates of all my nuclei, I, I can make isocontours. So I can plot con lines of constant beta decay rate, and I can look at lines of constant neutron separation energy. That's how much energy it costs me to remove a neutron from my nucleus, and I can plot those, so those would be in green. Okay. And the reason I would want to do that is because if I'm in equilibrium, the abundance of the, every isotope of, of, an, of a given element is determined by the separation energy, if I'm in a equilibrium. Okay, so with all of these curves that I can put on this flow diagram, how am I gonna form a structure? Okay, so I'll form a structure in this way. So here's my path, these are all my nuclei, and it happens to run along a line of constant neutron separation energy. So I, I'm in an equilibrium okay, between neutron capture and photo dissociation. So that means there's equilibria. So every isotope along, 
every, every nucleus along this line, which is all isotopes of the same element, are in equilibrium. And then I also plot along here my line of constant beta decay rate. So let's look at these three nuclei. Inevitably, they'll beta decay. So they beta decay, and they all beta decay at the same rate, because they're parallel to a line of constant beta decay. And then they beta decay, and they realize, ah, I'm off the path. I'm out of equilibrium. What am I going to do? So they capture back onto the path. Except this one captures onto the path here. But this beta decay rate is slower. Okay? So the nuclei pile up at this point. And these, all, these similarly all beta decay at the same rate, and then they get back on the path. So when you see a kink here in the separation energies, that's when you have pile up. Okay, so here are a few snapshots of calculations to illustrate this point. So here are my blue and green lines, and you can see this is kind of early in the calculation, and you can tell because this is stability over here, and I'm out here. These things all decay at the same rate, and the path is really kind of flat, at parallel to the beta decay rate, so they're all decaying at the same rate, and you can look up here at the abundance pattern, it has a strong odd even effect which you have to ignore, so just bring your eye up here to the top line, and you can see there's not really a lot of feature going on there. Okay, it's pretty flat, because basically because the green lines and the blue lines are parallel. But if you look down here, you see the green lines are starting to cross the blue lines, and you can see the path is going straight up and down, and now I've got an actual peak forming here. So that's the basic mechanism for forming the peak. And now I want to show you another case of this. Okay, so this case is similar. So the red lines here, just to be clear, these are neutron capture, not separation energy, but the idea is very similar. So I see this huge kink here. All the nuclei are lined up on the path, and I go over here and I see a beautiful peak. Well, maybe not so beautiful, I have a hole over here, but let me not worry about that right now. And actually, I can see where it comes from. The hole is from right here. And then I let the calculation run longer, and I say, oh, look, these lines are actually getting more parallel. And I can see my peak is getting washed out. And then by the end, you can see I have no peak anymore. So why am I showing you a failed calculation? So if it depends on whether I get a peak or not depends on the conditions. If I had run out of neutrons here, I would have frozen this peak in. And I would have been good. But I didn't. I ran out of neutrons somewhere between here and here. So the structure, the nuclear structure, actually determined whether my peak got washed out or not. So if I had one set of astrophysical conditions, then I would have gotten a peak. But with another set, the one I used, or the one I should say my student, Matt Mumpower, who's now a postdoc, used, then I would have, and then I got nothing. Okay. So if I could go and actually measure whether there's a kink in that separation energies, then I could say, well, then I could make a good guess at whether this, this, for, this, this, uh, this forms either by the neutron capture mechanism or by the fission cycling, which is a big clue to where the R process is. And if I see where the kink is, then I can go back and I can start narrowing down what my temperature and density have to be to make the R process. And this is the region that you would have to measure. And this is the kind of thing that you can start to look at, for example, with experiments at Triumph and would become accessible at EFRIB at MSU. Okay, so the discussion of this second part of the talk is that if you constrain, we suggest that if you constrain astrophysical conditions by studying the sensitivity of this abundance pattern to the nuclear physics and astrophysics, then that will be productive. So I gave a specific example of this rare earth peak. There are two options for how you form it. One is a kink structure in the separation energies, and the other is daughter products of fission cycling finding it. And so if you can go look for that, then you can go back to the astrophysical conditions, and then you can determine what they have to be, and then you can say to your friend who does mergers or does supernova, hey, can you get these astrophysical conditions? Is this allowed in your model, or is it not? 
Okay, so now I want to move on to the third part of my talk, and that's that's uh, that's back to astrophysical sites. Yep. What are the prospects of those sites? I think they're pretty reasonable. Um, so uh, I've talked to I've talked to some people at Triumph, so they they only have to decide if this is what they want to do or not. And there's. Uh, um, at the Caribou experiment at Argonne, some of these are accessible. And here, and a larger region would be accessible at FRIB. Somebody, I mean, it's just, once it's built, it's the, it's whether the, you know, the, the pack decides they want to put time into so this. They are built up along this path that parallels the path of stability, and then they beta K back from all the longer time scales to that. Sorry, you mean this plot? Well, no, in the plot you were just showing. Oh, yeah. Right, the, the red dots are stable. Yeah, th well, those, this is all, yes. But the, 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 the uh, isotope being built up shifted away in the front direction from that path. Yeah, that yes, yes. So the structure, actually, I could, well, I don't have it here. The, they're, um, yeah, so the, the, a lot of the R process is forming the the it's the path is out here for a long time, but in the mechanism I just described for making the rare earth peak, it it actually gets formed in here during your decay back to stability. So this is the kind of re so that's like we're talking like ten or a few more units in neutron number for stable nuclei. So this is what will become accessible with radioactive beam facilities. And what sort of lifetimes of the nuclei along this? Offset path. Oh, they're pretty. They're pretty short, so I have to look that up for you. That's why you need a radioactive beam facility. Okay, so now I want to look at. I don't want to look at supernovae or or mergers. I want to look at an alternate site. So I'll, I'll have to pick one. So these are some options to pick that are in the literature. So uh, one idea is that supernovae, the sub-digit supernovae form jets. And they've, basically they form jets and so the entropy can stay low. And you can have, so the material can be quite neutron rich and they, there can be the R process there. There's, this is actually what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about, perhaps you have collapsars around that form disks that allow you to make our process nucleosynthesis. And I want to talk about how there's special neutrino physics going on there that would make that an option. There's an, the idea that in oxygen neon magnesium supernovae, you can have um, lumps of material that don't get heated so much, are still very neutron rich, and that makes the R process. There's an idea that Perhaps, you know, we're all looking in the wrong place with a primary R process where you start with free neutrons and protons and it's actually a secondary R process and it's occurring also in supernova but it's occurring like in the helium shell and you have, you're spalling, you're using neutrinos to spall neutrons from nuclei and it's those neutrons that are making the R process. And uh, then there's the idea that Perhaps there's a sterile neutrino, a sterile neutrino of the type that is kind of hinted at by the reactor neutrino anomaly and LS and D and mini moon and a, a sterile neutrino of that type will make the neutron, the neutrino wind more neutron rich. But for the moment, I won't, won't discuss all of these. For the moment, I just want to discuss this one. Okay, so. This is, a, this is still a picture of neutrinos from a compact object merger, but uh, would be similar to um, a collapsar disk. And I actually want to talk about the neutrinos from a merger first, because it's a little more straightforward. So you don't have a beautiful, you don't have a beautiful spherical proto-neutron star to emit neutrinos from. It's actually got this very complicated geometry, the neutrino surface. It's a nice picture by Liliana Caballero. And the neutrinos, they wind up streaming away and they're hottest, they're emitted hottest at the center and coolest at the edges. Okay. So if you, you're looking at the nucleosynthesis, so you're looking at, 
if you, this is a top view of that. So you're looking at material that starts here in free neutrons and protons and streams away from you. And then the neutrinos are coming along and hitting that material from behind and looking at setting the neutron to proton ratio. So again, I'm interested in, um, I'm interested in these reactions, neutrino capture on neutron and anti-neutrino capture on proton. And it's a, li it's a little bit tricky because they come from complicated neutrino surfaces. In principle, we have to uh, include general relativity, but in the neutrinos, the fact that the neutrinos' paths change and their energies change, but, um, and also the neutrinos oscillate. So today, I'm just going to look at the oscillations without the general relativistic effects included. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the neutrinos above a merger type disk, and I'm going to try to oscillate them. So I'm just going to evolve the neutrino flavor transformation equations. So this, I'm solving equations of this type. OK, so this is. Um, just your regular quantum mechanical equations. So this is the Hamiltonian and this is the wave function. Okay, so it's just your time-dependent Schrodinger equation, wave equation. And uh, so the way I've written it is a two-by-two two system. So this wave function has electron neutrinos and it has mu ne muon neutrinos. And uh, I have to evolve it with this, Hamil with this Hamiltonian. Now, that's not actually how we do the calculation. We actually have a three by three, because you have three flavors of neutrinos. And we actually the, we have a 1,000 energies or so that are all coupled together that we solve at the same time, because these quantities are energy dependent. But this, this captures, writing it this way, captures really the basic physics, the essential physics. So in this Hamiltonian, there are three main pieces. One of these is the vacuum contribution. And that just comes from the fact that your neutrino is not, its mass basis and its flavor basis are not the same. So you just evolve something that's not, not uh, in the wrong basis, and you wind up seeing it evolve. And that's what happens uh, in terrestrial exper uh, neutrino experiments. If I add in a matter potential, that's when uh, neutrinos actually see the neutrons and protons and electrons at some level that is around this size, then the neutrinos will do the kind of thing they do in the sun. So this, these two contribute to the solar neutrino problem, or, or allow for the solution of the solar neutrino problem. But then in an environment where I have a lot of neutrinos, I have to add a third one which is the neutrino self-interaction potential that the neutrinos see from scattering off themselves. So I'm going to take all these things, and I'm going to solve it, and then I have to plot the results somehow. So I'm going to, when I plot results, I'm going to plot it in terms of survival probability. Okay. So if this is my wave function, and I start with an electron neutrino, and I still have an electron neutrino, then this is 1. Okay, so if nothing has happened, I'm plotting one. And if my electron neutrino has completely transformed into a muon neutrino, then I have a zero. Okay. So I'm just going to do it. I'm going to run the whole big calculation with, with a thousand energies and um, electrons, muons, and tau neutrinos, but starting with only electron and anti electron type neutrinos. And so if you could first look only at the top plot. So I have distance on this axis, distance the neutrino has traveled, and I have survival probability on this axis. So as you can see, and I'm doing it both for electron neutrinos and for electron antineutrinos, which are also coupled together in addition to all these energies. So I can see in the beginning nothing happens. Nothing happens. The neutrino travels. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. And then. All the electron neutrinos go away over some nice, beautiful, long time scale relative to neutrino physics. And the electron antineutrinos, they come down, and then they come up again. OK, so uh, neutrino physics is a pretty well studied um, area. So you can say, well, this is a pretty, pretty clear pattern. 
And why don't I go to what I know about neutrino physics, see how neutrinos oscillate what we call in vacuum, in terrestrial environments, see how they oscillate in the sun, uh, see how they oscillate in supernova, and see if this matches any of those. And it doesn't match any of these. Okay? So this is, this is not the same thing that neutrinos do other places. This is something special. OK, so we can go back and say, well, what's going on here? Well, we can go back to this equation that I'm evolving and say, well, what's special about it? OK, so this, this piece here, this piece is, the co this is called coherent forward scattering of electron neutrinos on neutrons, protons, and electrons. But we subtract out the the part, the neutral current part, so we only wind up, it's only proportional to the electron number density, or the net electron number density. This is the neutrino self-interaction potential, which is the neutrinos scattering on neutrinos minus the neutrinos scattering on antineutrinos. So that's, that's where these terms come from. So why would these, why would what you put into the calculation be any different in this environment than it is, say, in a supernova where you also have lots and lots of neutrinos? And the first thing you might think of is that in a proto-neutron star, the neutrinos coming from there, the neutrinos outnumber the antineutrinos. Okay, and that's because the proto-neutron star is deleptonizing. So you started, originally you had an iron core, sort of more or less Ye of a half, and you're making something neutron rich, and that lepton number has to go somewhere. In this case, you're going the other way. You start with something that's super neutron rich, and it heats somewhat. And so you're adjusting the neutron to proton ratio, and that, that lepton number has to go somewhere. So this potential, it's very unusual that this potential is negative, but it is negative in this environment. And so you can say, well, maybe what's happening is that I have this big negative neutrino potential, and it's exactly canceling my big positive um, matter potential. And so you can plot the neutrino potential and the negative, well, of the, uh, this is the matter, matter potential and the negative and the neutrino potential, and you can see that indeed the oscillation does start at exactly the point where they cancel. Okay. And, and we can go a little bit farther, and we can say, well, we have a beautiful uh, phenomenological idea of what's happening, that, and the, these formulas, they don't really matter too much, but the, it basically says the, the neutrinos are trying to oscillate in such a way so that the, they, the neutrino potential continues to exactly match the matter potential. We call that sitting on the resonance. And so you can come up with an approximate expression for what the survival probability should be, and you can plot them, and you can see that it works really, really well even down to these little curves you get here. Okay. So that's what's happening to the neutrinos. They, they really like to be on the resonance, and so they oscillate in exactly the right way so that they can stay on the resonance. Okay, so that was all, I said that was a merger disk, and that was a little easier to explain than, uh, than, the, than the collapsar disk. So the reason it's easier to explain is because in a collapsar disk, of course, you would expect you would have, you wouldn't expect the potential to be negative because if you just count numbers of neutrinos, you say, well, it's the same argument as in the proto-neutral star. I should have more neutrinos than antineutrinos, except that it's a geometric effect. This, this term that you're calculating is actually, it's the scattering. So it depends on the incidence angle. And the incidence angle changes as a function of of how far you are away from the disk because you're integrating over all possible incident angles. And so, oddly, you do have a, 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 a little piece where this potential is negative in this kind of disk. And at that point, you see a huge transition for actually for both the neutrinos and the antineutrinos, but 
it's well fit by that formula I showed you before that occurs right when these two potentials wind up canceling. So you wind up with this, with this oscillation and then you say, but will that, okay, so I, because I'm a neutrino physicist, I'm really excited about this, this neutrino phenomenon, but does it do anything to the nucleosynthesis? And you can see that it might, because if you look at the scale here, that's about the time when you have, uh, or a little before, when you have nuclei forming. Okay. And so we do a calculation. And this is before, so the crosses now are the data that we're trying to match. And this was before we included the oscillation. And this is after we wind up including the oscillation. So getting rid of the neutrinos is just enough to make the material sufficiently neutron rich that we get all the way out and we make all kinds of R process elements this way. Okay, so in this third part of the talk, what I discussed is that if you're in a situation where the antineutrinos outnumber the neutrinos, and disks are a good example of this, but a hypermassive neutron star that forms when you have merging neutron stars would be another good example, a new flavor transformation phenomenon occurs. And we actually call this a matter neutrino resonance transition. And this transition will change the result of wind nucleosynthesis, and it can change it pretty dramatically. And it may also wind up changing, because it happens so close, it may wind up changing the neutrino heating that you get in the wind also. So that's something we haven't studied yet. What, what's net change in the outgoing Y material? What's the net change in the, well? In the present draft, these oscillations. Um, I mean, I mean, discuss the influence on uh, our process feeds, but, but just because of the bulk properties of the of the outgoing matter. Oh. Uh, the bulk electron fraction. Oh, the, you mean including the tidal, if you're, yeah, so I'm only talking about the wind, not about the, not about the rest of it. But it depends on exactly where the oscillation um, yeah. takes place. But you can, you can drop the YE by 0.1 or more this way. And so that's really the, what the, our process is sensitive to. Right Range oh yeah, yeah. Even it can be sensitive to even less than that. Okay. All right. So it's time for the conclusions of my talk. So uh, we're trying to figure out what we're, what it is. What's the astrophysical side of the R process? And there's two main contenders. One is neutron star mergers. The other is core collapse supernovae. And so one way that the community is going about this is improving modeling of these astrophysical objects. So, I see, so another thing people are doing is exploring alternate sites. And I just gave you an example of one, which is that the disks that form around collapse stars. Another is to go actually go to nuclear physics and try and understand. There hasn't been a huge amount of work in saying, this is what the pattern this nuclear physics produces exactly this pattern, because we really haven't had too much data yet to do that. But that is something that, that may start to happen in the next years. Then I gave specific examples of these things from today. One is that the one was about the rare earth peak, that little red bump, how it's formed. It could be formed either by a kink in the separation energies or from fission cycling. That's something that could give us a big clue to the R process. And then I talked about neutrino oscillations. And I talked about the matter neutrino resonance, which is a new kind of oscillation that comes uniquely from material that starts with lots of neutrons and emits a lot of neutrinos, and how that will change the result of the nucleosynthesis that you get from this environment. So thank you. What is it? I'm sorry, I didn't notice here. Has the solar system our process had? So the. the halo star had, which presumably came from, from its early processes. So the. the um, 
Let me go back. So, so the blue curve is the, the solar system pattern, and the red dots are from one, one star. So, the, so in, the, in this part of the pattern, anyway, the red dots do a pretty good job on the blue curve. So it's, it's suggesting that something similar happens over and over again, and that what you see in the solar system is not a random collection of our processes that did all different things. So there's no related process that adds to this pattern? Uh, well, there, it, seems, it doesn't seem like the pattern evolves. It seems like you're, there are a few, okay, so in the actinides out here, there's something called the actinide boost problem, and, and out here there is a little bit of difference. But for this part, there's not, not much difference. What, what is the idea? Uh, that I don't remember. Don't remember off the top of my head. I can find it. So you were saying whatever process you're going to you're going to empathize or you're going to promote as an explanation it will continue to happen over the last shape. Yes, it will continue to happen and just does something in exactly the same way. Or if you want it to be two different processes, then they have to do the same thing. I mean, suppose you wanted some. Suppose you wanted to explain this part of the pattern with both neutron stars and core collapse supernovae, then, then you have to make, then you have to create conditions that are very similar in order to get exactly the same pattern. This, this part is not, it's not the case in this lighter part. There's variation there. But not every supernova collapse is a collapse Not every, yeah, uh, yes. I mean, it would be the, so it would say, if it, if it was collapsars, then you would say you're not getting our process from the regular supernova, which is actually consistent with calculation, and that you would be getting them from the collapsars. They'd have to be more frequent. Well, it wouldn't have to be, but they would hopefully be more frequent early in the evolution of the galaxy. So uh, in the case of the binary mergers, you need to eject a lot of our process per event. Yes. And how much mass can you actually Process through this resonance region. Um, oh, that. Doing the process at the minus two solar masses. So. That is, I had a slide about that. Yeah. So this, there are a couple estimates that are about this size. So it's not quite ten to the minus two. So, Basically, like, if there's no ambiguity in this, everything that gets ejected in these lens would have this enhanced anti-neutrino flux. Well, experience this enhanced anti-neutrino flux. So the the basic the the basic requirement for for getting this oscillation is is just that you have more anti-neutrino more anti-neutrinos than neutrinos. Now, you can, we haven't done a full ex exploration of whether you always get the necessary, all necessary conditions or not. You also have to have the crossing point. So you have to have the, you have to have a certain matter density and a neutrino density at some point. Let me show you. Where is it? So this does, yeah, so this does depend on the relative mass flux to neutrino flux. Yeah, so if, I, if my mass is a lot larger, I go up here, I'd never get a crossing. Right. So, so it could be some directions in which you never get a crossing. So as the torus evolves, you would expect the two amplitudes of those two potentials to shift the perspective. They'll change. Yeah. So, the, so and it could be that neutrinos going in some directions see it and not in others. And certainly, it'll change as a function of time, yes. So the, that was the, the, just, just my question. So the net yield of, of material which experiences this cancellation of things. I, yeah, so I don't have the answer to that yet. So this is, I mean, that's something I want to work on. Um, so we have some calculations of mergers that have, new, that have neutrino fluxes everywhere, and we want to see, you know, in what direction, and then they also have winds. So first we want to, first we're now in the process of calculating the, 
what happens to the neutrinos in various directions, and then we can go back and look at the winds and see what material experiences this and what doesn't.